Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture four of my course on network systems. Um, as you recall, in the previous three chapters, we reviewed examples of dynamical systems over networks. We reviewed some basic elements of matrix theory, Jordan normal forms, uh, convergence notions, and more importantly, the Perron Frobenius theory. And then in chapter three, we reviewed graph theory and various connectivity notions. So this chapter four is very exciting because what we do in this chapter is we bring together um, some of the concepts from chapter two. So for example, these notions of irreducibility and of primitivity of a, of a matrix, of a row stochastic matrix, non-negative unit row sum matrix. And, and those notions, which are graph theoretical notion, it's hard to give a lot of intuition for them. The time when we give intuition is today, because today we will connect those notions with some beautiful, simple, uh, very intuitive concepts from graph theory, right? So let me, and let me give you an outline for, for today. So the, the fundamental concept that, that we will do uh, today is that um, non-negative matrices are in one-to-one -one correspondence with weighted digraphs or directed graphs, one-to-one hmm? -one correspondence. So what that means is that uh, every time, and maybe I can just jump forward and show an example. Every time you have a matrix here, I drew it on the right. Every time you have a, you have a non-negative matrix. So here, that's an example, right? Hmm? that matrix provides you with exactly the same information. You can go back and forth with a directed graph as illustrated in this bigger picture here on the right, on the left. How, how so, how does this happen? Well, it's very simple. Um, for example, let's consider node number, node number four. Hmm? Here's an example, node four. Node four corresponds to, um, well, row four, this is not a great example, but in any case, and column four. So every outgoing edge, if there was, well, okay, let's start with the, the example of the edge from one to two. The edge from one to two has weight 3.7. It's a directed edge, so I'll write it with an open parenthesis. And I associate to this a weight, um, a symbol, A12 equal to 3.7. So this means that to the edge 1, 2, I give a weight 3.7. And now, of course, naturally, I take this entry, 3.7, and I um, enter it into a matrix. In the case of node 4, node 4 has no outgoing edges. Therefore, all entries of the form a for j are equal to zero for all j. And so in fact, this is the content of that, of that row. Let me, let me emphasize it one more time. So the row number four is empty. All entries are equal to zero. However, there are several edges that are of the form a i four that are gonna be greater than equal than zero specifically in neighbors of node four, which is to say nodes that have an outgoing edge into node four are, of course, you can easily see that, a node two, node three, and node five, right? And they have weight 1.2, 1.9, 2.7 respectively. And if you come and you look at the, at the column corresponding to node four, you will see that A24 is 1.2. So that's A24, A34, a54, right? Now I can go from the directed weighted graph on the left to the uh, non-negative matrix on the right easily. That's what I just did. Or vice versa, if you give me any non-negative matrix, any non-negative square matrix, I will just um, associate to it a directed graph weighted whose order, which is the number of nodes of the directed graph, equal to the dimension of the square matrix. So let's say the matrix is of dimension n, then I get a directed graph with, of order n with n nodes. 
And then I associate to it um, the entries of the non-negative matrix tell me the weights of the edges. And let me, let me add one additional uh, bit of information here. So if you look on the main diagonal of the matrix there, as you come down, are the self weights or the weights of the self loops. And so here on the right, let me remove it. The only node, this is just a completely random example. So the only node that doesn't have, um, that has, sorry, that has a self loop is node five with weight 4.4. And so this 4.4 there is of course the same as the 4.4 in the matrix. So on the main diagonal of the matrix are the self loops, not the self weights. Okay, so let's go back to the outline. There is a natural way of mapping back and forth one-to-one -one correspondent between non-negative matrices and weighted directed graphs. So now what that means is that every concept for matrices will map back and forth, if and only if, with concepts for weighted directed graphs. Hmm? So there will be one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, for example, we will look at um, um, we will look at a number of properties. For example, you will see that here. Here's a silly example. A one n is a vector of row sums, and uh, I will maybe define this as d out uh, of, of right. These are row sums. And this corresponds to the weighted out degree. So we will see that the row sums of the matrix, if you just think about the interpretation I gave you, corresponds to the weighted out degree of a node. When I say weighted out degree, that's a concept that belongs to the right column of our, of our table here. But if I say, a one n that's an operation on a matrix, right? So that would fit naturally on the left. And here the equality signs tends to mean that they're exactly the same. Now, in this chapter, one in this chapter we're we're studying this uh, this uh, one to one relationship, and that essentially goes under the name of algebraic graph theory. So we will study this one-to-one -one, uh, mapping of concept from, from mat non-negative matrices and directed graphs. By the way, you may wonder, does such a theory exist for matrices with arbitrary sign? And the answer is no, it does not. It is not true that there exists a theory as rich, as fully developed and as powerful as the one that I'm about to present to you today for non-negative matrices and weighted directed graphs whose weights are uh, assumed to be always non-negative. So, well, if there is an edge, the weight is strictly positive. If there is no edge, it's the same as assuming that the weight is zero. One way of understanding many of the results in algebraic graph theory is to start from a very, very simple lemma, a very, very simple relationship, which will tell you something about the relationship between the matrix powers of A, so A is non-negative matrix, and I take multiple powers, and the existence of directed walks of length k. So there will be an if, an if, an if, if, if and only if, so in a very natural way of relating the powers of a matrix with the collection of walks that exist on your, on your graph. And more specifically, if I were to take the ijth entry of the matrix raised to the power of k, then this entry is positive if and only if there exists a directed walk, one at least, of length k from i to j. Hmm? We're going to see this little result. It's a little, little result but it's the result that enables many of the results that follows. And it enables an understanding of the following important concepts. So we said that in, in chapter two, we said that A is irreducible. 
right? Or we said primitive, depending upon whether the sum of a to the k is positive or there exists a k such that a to the k is positive. Hmm? And these concepts are mapped very nicely <coughs> in, uh, in properties of the graph. And the first property is that the graph is strongly connected. So let's say that I have a, a weighted diagraph. Uh, maybe I should, I should have written it like this. I have no negative matrix um, A, and I have a weighted diagraph G. Then these properties are that G is strongly connected. That was for the property of irreducibility. The second property of primitivity corresponds to the fact that the graph is strongly connected and aperiodic. Now these concepts of irreducibility and primitivity, right, were inside the Perot Frobenius theory. And these concepts of being strongly connected and aperiodic, these were in chapter three in the graph theory. So now we're seeing how they very nicely fit together. Perfect. Um, there will be also another, uh, uh, um, if, if you remember in the discussions of all of the connectivity properties of graph, there's also the possibility that the graph G has a globally reachable node, globally reachable node. I'm gonna write this GRN. So if I, if the graph may have a globally reachable node, that is to say a node such that from all other nodes in the graph, there exists a directed path to, the, to that particular uh, node, right? Which is globally reachable from everywhere. So the, the name is relatively uh, self-explanatory. And uh, let's imagine that, um, let's imagine that that node is node J. Um, you know, for example, without loss of generality, um, uh, not, I meant to say EG, for example, node J, right? The node J is globally reached. So what does that, that correspond to? Well, we will see that that corresponds to um, the Jth column of the sum AK um, is greater than zero. So you don't need the entire matrix to be to be positive, but you just need the column to be positive. And while I am at it, let me just remind you: this summation runs from zero to n minus one. Okay. Um, these are the main concepts in algebraic graph theory. This one-to-one -one relationship, which allows you to work out a number of very basic simple relationships. This very simple, let's call it fundamental lemma, very simple little lemma about powers of the matrix and walks in the direct graph. And, and this little lemma uh, leads very naturally to this very powerful uh, relationships and characterizations. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, I will give you some elements uh, of a slightly different discipline, which is called spectral graph theory. And, and, and now this theory will be, will be talking to you about the eigenvalues. Well, there will be several properties that I will discuss that fit within this, uh, this uh, nomenclature. Uh, I will be giving you some monotonicity property uh, of, of the uh, spectral radius of the non-negative matrix. Um, and then I will be showing you so, right, some properties, some monotonicity property and um, um, yeah, let's just say some monotonicity properties of the spectral radius. And, and you will see that in more detail. So uh, uh, later I will get to it. Okay. Okay, so this is now section um, 4.1. And here in this section, I just uh, want to very quickly review again the concept that we just introduced, 
that there is this uh, one-to-one relationship between uh, uh, weighted directed graphs and um, non-negative matrices. Um, some additional language is that uh, this is referred to as the adjacency matrix. So A, the language is that A is the adjacency matrix of the graph G. This is G. You could also say G is the weighted the directed graph induced or generated associated to a non-negative matrix A. So you can go back, back and forth. Now, um, in some cases, if the, if the directed the graph has no weights, so you do not have weights on the edges, then the convention is to assume that when, wherever you see an edge, uh, the weight is equal to one. If I don't tell you the weights, you can assume that the weights are, are unitary. And therefore, uh, to an undirected graph, uh, pardon me, to an unweighted graph, so it's directed graph, but without weights, it's very natural to associate uh, something referred to as a binary adjacency matrix. Mm -hmm. So the, this example here, uh, uh, here on, on, on the top uh, uh, right, this is a weighted adjacency matrix, but I can certainly work with binary adjacency matrices when I have no weights that, I, that, I am, that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And, and basically the weights are either one or zero, depending upon whether the directed edge from I to J exists, it's, it's in the edge set of, or not. Um, next concept is this, um, and I have already started to hint about it a little earlier. If you, um, if, well, let's come back here to, to this example. If you look at node, um, node one, node one has two outgoing uh, edges. Uh, one goes to node two and one goes to node three. So when you look at the matrix, they clearly appear on, on row number one. If I want to know the sum of the outgoing edges, well, I just need to sum the entries on the, on the first row of the matrix A. Hmm? That's very rel relatively simple. So remember that when you, when, you have a, when you have a matrix A and you multiply it by one N, this is the vector of row sums because of the usual concept that you multi when you have matrix vector products, it's just a, you know, row times columns. And when the column is the vector of ones, so you're basically just saying the entries of the row and summing them. So now with this uh, little uh, uh, background reminders, it should be relatively natural to understand that if I construct uh, um, the vector A1N, I have all of the out degrees of my, of my graph um, or the row sums of the matrix. And it is convenient in what, for what follows to define uh, a diagonal matrix. So a diagonal matrix, uh, a D out is the symbol that collects all of these out degrees, uh, which would be potentially in a vector D out, or any, any uh, I put them down as the main entries, as the entries on the main diagonal of the matrix D out. Similarly, you can define a, um, sorry, right, so this is the definition of a weighted out degree matrix, and you can define the weighted in degree matrix. Um, most, of, most of the times I may forget to repeat the word weighted, and it'll be obvious from the context. Is the graph weighted or unweighted? <coughs> if it's unweighted, then it's just a binary adjacency matrix. You do row sums, the row sums are going to be natural numbers. And you will, have, you will have an unweighted degree matrix, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna worry about that too much. It's relatively straightforward. All right, so now if I have a graph, let me just um, summarize. Given a, a weighted directed graph, um, so directed and also weighted, now we have its adjacency matrix, its out degree matrix, and its in degree matrix. Hmm? Okay, let me give you some examples. Um, Let's start by looking at the basic undirected graphs that we saw in chapter three. Um, they, they have a binary adjacency matrix associated to them. Moreover, their binary adjacency matrices are even symmetric because in this basic, these were basic undirected graphs. And therefore in an undirected graph, whenever there is an edge from I to J, there's an edge back from J to I. And so all of these uh, uh, pictures here, so uh, the, the picture of the, adjacency matrix for P6, C6, S6, K6, K33, 
um, are, as you see here, and they are symmetric. Each of them is symmetric. And in case you forget, this was our little convention for the for the symbol to illustrate the case of a of a of a path graph, a ring graph, a star graph, the, the complete graph, or the complete bipartite. Hmm? Um, I will let you read um, in the book this example. Essentially, for each of the basic graphs, you can you can easily uh, sit down, think carefully, and write down formulas for what the corresponding adjacency matrix is. Here I have outlined them. Moreover, now comes a new word for the adjacency matrix. I may be interested in not only its row sums and column sums, which are the out and in degree vectors, but also I may well be interested in the adjacency spectrum of the graph, which is the spectrum of the adjacency matrix. And um, here, we're not gonna use this too much for these basic graphs, but uh, you should know that for, for basic graphs, it is entirely possible, fun, and in some cases useful to, to compute the adjacency spectrum and, and write it out. And so here I have written out uh, the spectrum for all of those uh, five basic examples. Hmm? The adjacency spectrum. In chapter six, we'll define something called the Laplace matrix, and we'll talk about the Laplace spectrum, and that'll be the set of eigenvalues of the Laplace. Right, just for clarity, the words, I didn't say this but before, but the word spectrum of a matrix, it refers to the collection of eigenvalues of the matrix. And um, another word that is defined on this page is the, is, is the word toplets. Uh, toplets matrices are matrices that have the feature of having uh, of having entries uh, which are all identical along all of the diagonals, right? This is a toplet matrix. And then there is also the specific case of circular matrix, which are fun matrices and they appear in the case of the cycle graph. And those are matrices where essentially the first row is, is equal to every other row with the feature, however, that when you go from row one to row two, you take the last you take the last entry of the first row and it becomes the first of the second and you shift all the entries by by one slot and you keep repeating uh, in an identical way so if you haven't heard about circular matrices go go read up about them on uh, for example wikipedia all right so we are beginning this beautiful um uh, tour of algebraic graph theory the premise you already understood the premise is that weighted digraphs and non-negative matrices are in one-to-one -one correspondence. And in this little table here um, is a set of simple relationships. So for example, if the graph is undirected, I stand corrected. The graph is undirected if and only if, not, if, not, not just if, it's, it's if and only if, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. The matrix, the adjacency matrix is symmetric. I should say it's adjacency matrix, or if you start from the if you start reading this table from the right, you would say the matrix A is symmetric if and only if it's associated the weighted undirected graph is undirected. Now the graph is weight balanced if and only if row sums are equal to column sums, um, and that is to say uh, D out is equal to D in. And node um, in the case where the, the graph has no self loops. Um, yeah, let me erase this and continue the discussion. Consider, restrict yourself for a second to the case where the graph has no self loops, which means the matrix has zero diagonal. Then a node of the graph is a sink, which is to say it has no outgoing edges if and only if the row sum is zero or the node is a source, which means it has no incoming edges, it only has outgoing edges, if the corresponding column sum is zero. So we, as you remember, because of the uh, averaging uh, dynamics over networks, we are very interested in the case where uh, matrices that are row stochastic. A row stochastic matrix is non-negative and the associated the weighted directed graph happens to have the property that each node has weighted out degree equal to one. That is to say, D out is equal to one, which of course is the usual relationship you've seen many times like that. Well, and, and D out 
is the diagonal of A1N, which is the diagonal of 1N, which clearly is the identity matrix in dimension N. Right. Well, I also briefly mentioned the possibility that the matrix be doubly stochastic. A, matri a matrix is doubly stochastic if both um, row and column sums are, are all equal to one. In that case, the node uh, has out and in degree equal to one. And so therefore D out is equal to D in and it's identically equal to one. Perfect. So these are basic, basic relationships. They don't need a proof, it's just a transcription. Instead, what does need a proof is this simple, simple, powerful lemma. I'm, I'm tempted to call it the fundamental lemma. Of algebraic graph theory. It surely is very elegant. I, I, I haven't seen this nomenclature any, anywhere, so I'm a little bit hesitant to, to, to put this in writing in the book. But, but nevertheless, here's the fundamental concept. It goes like this. Let's, let's work this out together. Um, clearly, um, pick any two nodes, i and j, and assume there is a, a, an, an edge from i to j. If there's an edge from i to j, I will think of that edge as a walk from i to j of length one. And now notice that clearly um, there exists a walk, a directed walk uh, of length one from I to J, if and only if A, I, J, uh, let me, let me uh, I'm already jumping ahead here. A, I, J is greater than zero. So when the walks are of length one, what I'm about to say is entirely trivial. Now, now comes this uh, beloved formula for the uh, 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 matrix uh, power. So if you have A square, what's A square? Well, A square is clearly uh, A times A, and I am interested in the ijth entry of that matrix. Well, the matrix A square is the ith row of ith row of A times the jth column of A, or the ij entry. And people write this standard formula for it, right? You sum, so this is the usual formula that you should remember from your matrix theory class. So if, you, if you're doing this inner product between the, the rows, you would say this is the sum over all the entries of the row, and the entries of the row are A, I, H. And then I'm, I do the dot product, so it's, it's uh, row times column, I do product sum, the sum of the products, right? And that's what that formula says. Notice in this slide, whether I write A, I, H, or I write capital A, I, H, it is, it is entirely the same. All right. Now, look at that formula that I have emphasized here and realize that there are many ways of reading it. Um, so the first, first of all, I am interested in when is it true that AIJ is positive? Sorry, that A square IJ is positive. When does that happen? Well, that happens if and only if there exists at least one node H such that both AIH and AHJ are positive. Why is that true? Because this summation here is a summation of numbers that are non negative. So it suffices that any one of them be positive that the sum is positive. In fact, it's an if and only if. So the sum is positive if and only if at least one entry is positive. So what does it mean for one entry to be positive? Well, it's the product of two numbers, two non-negative numbers. Both of them need to be positive for the same H. If, if A I1 and A 2J are positive, they don't get multiplied together. So it doesn't matter. You need the same H. Okay, so that's a very simple, algebraic property. So now we translate that from a property about the, the matrix A to a property about the graph. So A squared IJ is positive if and only if A I H and A, sorry, I H and H J are edges in G because we know that the, the coefficients, uh, uh, what do we know? We know that A I H is positive if and only if IH is an edge. 
And now, now you see, I think, where I'm going. Now, if I have an edge from I to H, and then I have an edge directed from H to J, well, what that means is that there exists a directed walk of length two from I to J, because it's I, H, J. And that's what the summary here that I have. So what have we learned? Now what we've learned is that I can go down here to the bottom and change my, my statement and say, um, there, I can, or I can write an identical statement, just say there exists a walk of length two from I to J, if and only if a square IJ is positive. Hmm? Now, now, you know, I'm not gonna continue this. I'll, I'll leave it to you as an exercise, uh, uh, 4.6, but essentially now you can, you can use a proof by recursion. You can see the mechanism, you use a proof by recursion and you can prove this, you know, the elegant and powerful fundamental lemma. The lemma goes, is the lemma that relates the directed walk, the existence of directed walks of a given length between the given nodes with the powers of the adjacency matrix. And what does this uh, lemma says? Well, you set yourself up, your usual setup, nothing, nothing surprising or new here, weighted the directed graphs and nodes, adjacency matrix A. Um, there's one twist. I'm also going to, for the matrix A, consider the possibility that the matrix be, be binary. And let's, let me use the symbol A sub zero one. Let's suppose that I want to write a version of this statement for the matrix, for a binary matrix. So then what happens? The following two statements happen. Um, if you have a weighted matrix, the IJ entry is positive if and only if there exists a walk of length K from I to J. And the K is the power uh, of the, the power of the matrix. It's the same as the length of the walk. So that's perfect. Okay? Moreover, there's one more information that you can extract from the previous uh, page. Let's look at this uh, 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 product, well, sum of product terms again. Now, if, if the entries are binary, then the product between one and zeros are, it's, it's one only when both edges exist. Then I sum over it. So how many times do I sum this number one? I sum as many times as there are edges, as there are nodes H that are connected both from I and to J. So the theorem here says, the lemma here says that take a binary adjacency matrix, raise it to the power of K, the IJ entry is now equal to the number of walks from K of length K from I to J, distinct walks, the number of distinct walks. And, and walks here are directed walks that possibly include self loops, just to be clear. So in other words, if you have a node here, I, then you have a node H, you have a node K, H, and you have a node L, and then you have a node J, uh, you know, J there, then if, if this is the situation, let's say there are no other, no other nodes that are connected from I and to J, then there would be three distinct paths that go from I to J of length two. Perfect. Okay, so I am now ready to take that fundamental lemma of algebraic graph theory, this concept that you can take powers of matrices and you get, you get walks. Uh, you can read off the number or, or the existence of directed walks of a given length between nodes. And I want to uh, do that connection between walks on graphs and irreducibility, primitivity, and other properties of the matrix. So uh, before I get into it, let me give you a little bit of, let me just introduce um, three little concepts that I will use in the, in the next slide. So first of all, um, let me start from, from the bottom here. So if I have a matrix uh, that, that uh, appears in this particular form as here in the box, I will refer to it as block triangular. So you have a square matrix A and you can find an index R, some number, and the, the bottom left block 
is composed of only zeros. So it's upper triangular, or I'm just going to say triangular. So for clarity, it's important to understand that B and D are square matrices, not of the same dimension. Uh, it, could, it, it would naturally be that B has its dimension and D has its dimension. And they, they could very well be different. One would be R, the other would be N minus R. But so in, in other words, when you write it, maybe I can draw a picture here. Uh, this could be small and that would be big. This would be the block, a square block. That would be a square block. I guess my picture here is not entirely uh, perfect. But in any case, this would be two squares. You know what I mean? I drew, I drew that line a little too high. OK, and now I need this to be a matrix of all zeros. And, and of course, uh, here it's, it's arbitrary. So it has to be square. All right, that's a block triangular matrix. Now, the next problem is that you could have a matrix, which is, you look at it, and it's not block triangular. But if you reorder the entries of the matrix, if you shuffle them by means of a permutation matrix, if you do a permutation transformation, then it may become block triangular. Mm. So what's the similarity transformation? Remember, similarity transformation is I have a matrix A and I, I map it to T, A, T inverse. So that's a similarity transformation. I could perform a similarity transformation using a permutation matrix. So P is a permutation matrix. What, what is that? It's a situation where, for example, three by three, on each line and on each column, there are, first of all, it's a binary matrix. On each line and on each column, there exists precisely only one number equal to one. All of the other numbers are equal to zero. So I could come here and I could just say, hey, you know, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna put a one here. That means that necessarily these are zeros. And then I will put a one here. That means these are zeros. And then I have to put a one there. Mm -hmm. So in order to give you some intuition for permutation matrices, I have a little example a little bit later on. Forgive me, let's do it. Let's do it now. So imagine that I have precisely that example that I just introduced, a permutation matrix like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the intuition between a, behind a permutation matrix? Well, the intuition is that suppose you apply a permutation to the numbers one, two, three, then if you think for a second about this matrix here, multiply one, two, three. So then when you do P times one, two, three, you obtain, well, the number one will hit the first entry and it will end up at the third position. The number two will multiply that and will end up at the second position. And the number three will multiply this entry and will end up there. What does that mean? That means that I had the number one, two, three, Actually, maybe I could have used a different notation. I imagine I have a vector alpha, beta, gamma. Then when I use the, my P matrix, um, exactly that one, applied to alpha, beta, gamma, what I get is I get a reordering of the entries, uh, beta, gamma, alpha. Hmm? Perfect. So a permutation matrix just permutes the position of the entries of a vector when you apply P to a vector. If you want to bring the entries back in the same order in which they were, you should say, well, Francesco, you should apply P inverse to beta, gamma, alpha, and you should get back the original vector. It turns out that permutation matrices are actually orthogonal. And what that means is that the P inverse is just equal to P transpose. So this is really, truly remarkable. If you just look carefully here, and if you think about it for a few seconds, few seconds, I should say, uh, P and P transpose are there. So that's P and, and that's P transpose, right? It's very easy to go from P to P transpose. And magically, it just so happens to be the case that if you just take any row and you multiply by this corresponding column, so row one times column one, you get the number one. Row column, you get one. Row column, you get one. And if you take one row and you multiply by columns with a different index, you get zero. Hmm? All right, 
So permutation matrices are very elegant objects and you can uh, just transpose them and you get the inverse permutation. Um, in that sense, they're kind of like also rotation matrices, but in any case, and finally, um, I'm not gonna do it by hand because it would be a little bit tedious. When you do a similarity transformation using a permutation matrix, that's what I do here. Then if you look carefully, I have taken a matrix A with entries one, 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 two, one, three, and so forth. And what I've done is that I've just reshuffled them. I've just reshuffled them and they're all here. They haven't gone anywhere. They're the same, they're the same number, but I have just, uh, I've just remapped them. For example, the entries of the first, second and third rows of A, of A are mapped respectively to the third, first, and second row of A, and at the same time, the entries of the column are also mapped. So you're basically shuffling rows and shuffling columns, well, reordering, permuting, actually the correct word is permuting. Okay, perfect. So that's the point is that perhaps my matrix, I have a, ma well, let, let me go back to, to, to where I was. Here I was saying, I am interested in block triangular matrices. But it is possible, so I'm interested in zeros that have z matrices that have zero in the, in the bottom left here. And I need to worry about the possibility that they are zero down there, but they will be zero down there after a permutation. Hmm? Okay, perfect. So that's why I had to introduce the concept of a permutation matrix. Um, finally, um, well, let me, just, let me just remind you, if I have a set of indices one through N, it's always possible to break it up into two subsets. For example, maybe let's say that n is the number is the number five. Then you can certainly per, you can certainly break it up into two subsets. Let's say one, four, five, union, two and three. Mm -hmm. So that's a partition of the set of indices. So that's the trivial concept. I just partition the indices. One thing is I don't want I don't I I, I don't consider the union of one, one, two, three, four, five with the empty sets to be a partition. A partition has to be, has to be two subsets which have nothing in common and they're non-empty and their union gives you back the full set. Okay. All right, now you should tell me, Francesco, why do I care about all of this? Why do I care about all of this? So um, let me try to uh, give you some motivation for it. As you recall, in the Perron Frobenius theorem, we really wanted to work with matrices that had the property of being irreducible. We wanted to work with matrices that are irreducible even more. We wanted to work with matrices that were primitive. But um, why do we want to work? Well, because remember, these matrices had very nice properties. I'm just going to remind you here, and then I will continue. These matrices had the property that they had um, a, a, a dominant. Eigenvalue lambda, it was strictly positive, it was simple, it was weakly dominant, not strictly dominant, but in any case, and it had the left and the right eigenvectors, which was which are, which were can be selected to be strong, uh, strictly positive, and so on and so forth. So they had a number of properties, irreducible matrices. But the other thing you should remember from chapter two is that the definition of irreducible, while it is very well posed, I, mean, I just told you take uh, k powers. And let me know if, uh, if uh, after you take um, the sum of powers from uh, k equal to zero to m minus one, if that's positive, then I call the matrix uh, irreducible. So that's fine. It's, it's, a, it's a correct definition. It's not wrong, but it doesn't give you the intuition about what is really happening in the matrix, which matrices are irreducible. Francesco, give us some intuition for it. All right. So here's the intuition. Basically, in one sentence, the answer is, a matrix is irreducible if and only if the associated weighted digraph is strongly connected. Remember, strongly connected is the property that from any node, you can go to any other node. Here's an example uh, at the bottom here. Suppose I have this first graph here. I have node one, I have node two, and I have node three. Um, and I have edges from, I have edges from one to two, from two to three, from three to one, also, I have an edge from three to two. But look at this matrix. Clearly, I can go on a path on a directed walk from one to two, from two to three, and from three to one. So when you go on a directed walk that touches every node, clearly you can go from every node to every other node. 
So my inspection, this particular uh, example is strongly connected. Here's another example. I have the node one, the node two, the node three. Now I have taken the edge um, that uh, goes, uh, this was going up here. This was going from three to two. Now I've changed the direction and I made it from one to three. That small change is very significant because now you can go from one to two and from one to three, but there is no way of going back once you are in the compartment of nodes two, three, you cannot go back. Once you are in the subgraph containing nodes two and three, you cannot go back to one. All right, so the, the bottom line is that by inspection, I've noticed that this is strongly connected. And this is not strongly connected, although it has two globally reachable nodes, which are two and three. So let us now illustrate that this theorem 4.3 is correct, meaning to say, um, if the, the, the matrix is irreducible, if and only if the graph is strongly connected. So first of all, let's take the, the, the graph and associate to it uh, the associated, the uh, adjacency matrix. So first row are the edges that leave node one. So there is no self loop from one to one. So that's the zero. There's an edge from one to two. So that's one. And there's a zero, meaning to say there is no edge from one to three. On the other hand here, there is an edge from one to three because I changed the direction of the edges, right? Next node, look at node two. If you want, draw a little circle around node two. Think about all the outgoing edges. There's only an edge from two to three. So A two three must be positive and all of the other A to J are zero. Therefore you get zero, zero, one. Then look at node three and you get one and one because there's an edge from three to two and from, from three to two and from three to one. Hmm? Okay, let me erase our, our calculations here because they're elementary and just make the picture more complicated. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that this is the matrix that is um, the, um, that's the matrix associated to that directed graph. So let's call this A. Let's also remember A to the zero is always equal to I3, the identity. And now I, I need to compute the sum of A, K. K runs from zero to two because this is the matrix of dimension three. That is I3 plus A plus A squared. And I need to prove that it is positive because otherwise I found a contradiction with my theorem. Hmm? Now let's check one thing. So clearly there is a pattern of ones and zeros in A and then I sum the identity. So in other words, I will have ones here, here and here. When I do the sum, when I do the sum, I will have ones everywhere. Well, not everywhere, everywhere on the main diagonal. The only two entries that I need to check, is it true that the one three entry and two one entry are positive? Hmm? One. So I need to check that a square one three is positive and a square two one is positive. That's what I need to check. And I can do it in many ways. For example, let me, let me simplify things here. For example, what does a one three mean? Well, we just said a one three is a, for the matrix two, for the matrix a square is a, is a path of length two from one to three. Is there a path of length two from one to three? Yes, there is through the node two. Hmm. And similarly, a, um, a two one for a square, a square two one, is, is there a path of length two from two to one? And the answer is yes, there is, right? Okay, perfect. So uh, I can, if you want me to do also the, uh, the, 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 the uh, empirical, let's just, let's just do it for uh, quickly. And, and then so that we are 100% convinced. Uh, 010, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. I take this matrix and I multiply it by itself. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 equal to, I'm just interested, I'm not interested in the whole matrix. I'm just interested in, uh, in this, this entry, 1, 3, and 2, 1, right? And so 1, 3 would be, would be let's make this bigger, uh, first, row times third column. And notice that it's positive because I have a one here and this one will hit that one and will give you, it'll give you this positive entry there. 
exactly what you wanted. And then the next question is, I am interested in the entry two, one. And so I need to look at, um, um, I speak a different color. I need to look at second row, which multiplies first column, right? Second row, first column. And the one here will hit the one right there. I hope you can see my pen, uh, at least what I'm emphasizing. And so that's positive. Okay, so I have given to you an illustration that um, indeed property one and property three are, are equivalent. So the key idea is a matrix, is, a non-negative matrix is irreducible if and only if the graph is strongly connected, the digraph is strongly connected. And I'll leave it to you to check that in fact here at the bottom in this, in this second example where I have removed or I changed the direction of an edge, if you now work with, uh, with a, a revised matrix, this revised matrix, what property does it have? It's the same matrix as before. I had a one uh, on the bottom left and it's now shifted to the top right. This new matrix is not irreducible anymore. If you do the products, you will not find a path of any length from node two or node three back to one. What that means is that for any K, A to the K contains uh, zero um, in the first column, right? Because the first column are the, indicate the presence of paths from nodes two, three, four, and so forth back to node to node one. Additionally, there are no self loops so that the full column is zero. And in fact, this is consistent with something that we discussed earlier. Earlier, we discussed that if a non-negative matrix uh, has a strictly, a strictly zero row or column, then any power continues to have that property. Okay, so this is the main intuition behind this, uh, this, uh, this theorem. The, in the main intuition is that um, irreducibility and strong connectivity are the same. I would say irreducibility is a little bit hard to um, interpret, but strong connectivity is, is very clear to interpret. So uh, certain complex properties of matrices, which are hard to get a feel for, happen to be to translate into very nice intuitive statements about, about graphs. Now, irreducible non-negative matrices have a wealth of properties, a very large number of interesting properties. And here, I'm giving you two more properties. And in the exercises, there are others. Now, property two is another matrix theoretic property. Property four is another graph theoretic property. Okay. So what are these other properties? So these are all if and only if, so it's all equivalent. The matrix is irreducible if and only if there is no per permutation matrix P such that after the permutation, the matrix is block triangular. What is the intuition behind this? This makes a lot of sense because if I have a matrix which is block triangular, then I think we discussed that when you compute the product, you have to, for the two one block here at the bottom, for that block here at the bottom, you need to do row times column. You can do that for blocks and it ends up getting, you end up getting a zero because this zero hits that entry and this non-zero entry hits that zero. Hmm? So in other words, row times column, you always get a zero. So a, per, so a matrix that is block, upper triangular will never give you entries on the bottom left, which are positive. Therefore, such a matrix can never be irreducible because irreducible would say, hey, powers will give you a positive matrix. You can never become positive. Okay, so that's the intuition. It turns out this is an if and only if because I have just given you intuition for one direction of the proof. The fourth statement is very interesting. The fourth statement is that um, your graph is strongly connected if and only if, no matter how you partition for all partitions of the index set, no matter how you partition the nodes, you put, for example, you take the nodes, you put some nodes, say 
the nodes one, three, and five on the left, and the nodes two and three on the right. No matter how you partition the nodes and you look at the cut through the edges, hmm? no matter how you partition them, there are always edges going from left to right and edges going from right to left. So for example, what this is saying is that no matter how you cut these edges here or there or there, you can always find edges going in both directions. This is true for the first example, but it's not true for the second example. So for example, here, if I do this cut, if I, in other words, construct the partition one, three, and two, that's the partition of the nodes. You can find an edge from, from, from one, one, three to two, and you can find a node, an edge from two to three. So that's fine. But the problem is you need to check this for all possible partitions. And now here, so a partition is equivalent to a cut. I can cut the nodes like that. Now my partition is one on one side and two, three, the other partition of the nodes. And now, you see, there are only edges going from one to two and three, but there are no edges going back. So my graph is strongly connected if and only if, no matter how I partition the nodes, I draw the graph and I draw the cat, I can always go through the cat from left to right and from right to left. That's what this statement is implying. And in this example, it fails here because that graph is not strongly connected. And it is satisfied here because this graph is strongly connected. All right, this is a nice theorem. If you come back to the summary, the outline of the chapter, um, where are we at here? We have reviewed this one-to-one -one relationship. We have reviewed many of the simple equivalences. We have reviewed this fundamental lemma that really tells you, hey, anything that has to do with walks, for example, notions of connectivity of the directed graph, are really related to just the powers of the matrix. And the notion of primitive of being irreducible was a notion for a matrix that had to do with powers. No surprise, there is a corresponding if and only if property for the associated digraph. Perfect. So that gives us a very good understanding of irreducible matrices. Hmm? These four equivalent characterizations. There are others in the in the exercises. I'm gonna skip the proof for now. I think I gave you plenty of intuition. Now, before I continue, let me just tell you that in some cases, for example, for that graph, one, two, three, you, you may be interested in a weaker property rather than strong connectivity. And the property is that of, of possessing a globally reachable node. So this lemma, says that using the same methods of proof for the previous theorem, you can state the following equivalence. So if, if, the, if the matrix A, when you raise it to the power of K and sum it for K running from zero to N minus one, if it's positive that we know that the graph is strongly connected, but maybe that matrix is not positive, but what happens is that one of the columns is positive, say the Jth column is positive. If the Jth column is positive, that's if and only if the jth node is globally reachable. So if I am interested in knowing that, you know, there exist paths from everywhere to the node two, what I need to do is to take A, sum A with, with um, itself all the way to the power K, uh, so, pardon me, to the power N minus one, look at the, second column and if this is positive well this is positive if and only if node 2 is globally reachable hmm? perfect all right I will skip this corollary. There are a number of simple properties that um, it's a way of, instead of having to worry about the sum over K, you just can consider A to the K for the case of digraphs that have um, self loops at each node. But I will skip this corollary. I'll let you read about it. Now comes the slightly stronger property. I, as you recall, I am interested, uh, we are interested in matrices that are primitive. 
The reason we're interested in matrices that are primitive, so this is section 4.4, right? Is because remember from Perron Frobenius theory, we want the existence of a simple of an eigenvalue lambda, which is strictly positive. It's, it's simple and it is strictly dominant, which is to say we want lambda to be strictly greater than the absolute value of mu, where mu is every other eigenvalue of the matrix. We get that when the matrix is primitive. It's not true that the strict dominance holds for irreducible, as you remember. So we're very interested in the, in the understanding when is it true that a matrix is primitive, which is to say there exists an index such that after some power, the matrix is positive. Here, I have a figure. In this figure, I have a pixel picture of the increasing powers of a non-negative matrix of dimension 25. And, and here, as you see, the original matrix A is rather sparse, meaning to say there are self loops. And also, I mean, intuitively, if you were to take all the nodes and uh, all of these 25 nodes and lay them out on a, on a line, you would see that you see every node, every node is connected. For example, node two is connected to the one before and two after. So anyway, you would see some, some skip connections like that. Uh, you know, you would see this would be 25. You would see one paths of length one and paths of length two. Sorry, my picture here isn't great. Also, I have I have added some random nodes, right, of longer longer length paths. I've some I've, I've added some some um, some some jumps, right, some links that go further. In, if you're interested, you can read the, on Wikipedia the story of small worlds, small worlds. So anyway, uh, here I've just taken a, a square, a cube, a fourth, a fifth. And you can see that for this matrix, as you keep taking powers, uh, the, the, the pattern of ones versus zeros is becoming denser and denser. And so from, from, uh, from one to two, from two to three, in the end, uh, you know, node four at uh, the fourth power, there exists a very few, uh, very few um, pairs of nodes that are not connected by directed walks of length four, and they require one more, one more hop, one more link. So at power five, the matrix is positive. That means you can find paths from every node to every other node of length precisely five. This is the property that we are interested in: primitivity of the matrix. Uh, I should say in, in some books, people refer to this as regularity of the non-negative matrix. Uh, I think it was Gantmacher who did that. Now, the theorem is, well, we already know that if it's primitive, if the matrix is primitive, then it's also irreducible. And we know that the matrix is irreducible if and only if the graph is strongly connected. So we already know that. The question is, what is the additional property that I need to make, sorry, that my graph needs to satisfy in order for a, um, the, the, the adjacency matrix associated with to be primitive. And that property is precisely the aperiodicity property. Hmm? So that's, that's this property here, aperiodic. So in the old theorem about irreducible um, with many, many characterizations, you just need to add one more property. You need aperiodicity, and that gives you full success, your matrix is primitive. Before I leave this topic, and I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, skip the proof, well, let me make a couple of comments on this property. One is, remember, a periodicity has to do with, what does it have to do with? It has to do with, um, you take simple cycles, simple directed cycles, You're interested in their length, the length of the simple direct cycle. These are numbers, right? You have a collection of numbers. I don't know. Let's call them L1 through L um, H. H is some number of directed simple cycles on your directed graphs. They're simple, meaning to say that the only node that is repeated is the first, which is equal to the last. And also remember, if you have a, 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 a if you have a cycle like one two three one one two three one is a directed cycle. It's the same cycle as two three one two, right? So mm -hmm. now you look for the common divisor 
of these numbers, L1 all the way through LH. If you find a divisor that is greater than one, for example, if you have a very simple directed graph like that, then the divisor is two. That's the periodicity of the graph. Another possibility is to have a graph uh, like that. Um, such a graph has period, uh, still period of two. Uh, if I remove some of the edges, this and, uh, no, I got it wrong. If I remove, if I give you a directed cycle graph like that, then the periodicity becomes four, right? So if, if there are periodic cycle only of length two, three, four, or five, whatever number, then you have a periodicity in the graph. But if you have directed cycles of length four and maybe of length three, for example, if I had an edge, if I had an edge like that, now all of a sudden I have a length, a length three, then the numbers three and four are relatively co-prime. When you put them together, there, there is no common divisor greater than one. So a periodicity means that there exists no common divisor. There exists no common divisor or the other, you know, greater than the number one. Okay, so this was in chapter three. That's the first uh, uh, intuition or elaboration of this theorem about strong connectivity and uh, um, primitivity. Now, let me tell you that um, there is, how, do, how does one do the proof? I don't want to do the proof for you, although it's very intuitive. It has to do with these notions of co-prime. And I will just say that, I will just refer you to, um, you know, remember at the end of each chapter, I have written some, uh, some historical notes or some additional. And so the, the proof of this, uh, of this theorem is related to something fun to read about, which is the coin problem. So if you're, if you're interested in, in, in following more on this, go read the on Wikipedia, the, the coin problem or uh, something referred to as the Frobenius number. This is a very nice little document by, by Owens uh, illustrating uh, what, that, uh, what that does. And this concludes my discussion of the main theorem about primitive matrices. Um, let me now take a short break. Very well. Uh, welcome back. Okay, so now uh, is the time when I will present the last section of the chapter. This is a chapter on algebraic graph theory, but in this particular section, we're going to use some, some uh, connectivity properties, some existence of certain paths in order to study properties of the spectral rate, spectral properties, spectral properties of the graph what that kind of means is where are the eigenvalues of the adjacency associated to the graph? It's just that it's kind of cool and fast and say spectral graph theory instead of saying where are the eigenvalues of the matrix of the adjacency matrix, okay? So that's, that's the story. So don't, don't be scared by the term spectral graph theory. It's, it's not. So um, here's what I want to do. Um, I want you to, I want to teach you how, how do you do the following task? Suppose I tell you that this is a two-dimensional grid graph. Uh, it has, uh, you know, it was, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a regular Cartesian grid. It has four uh, times seven nodes, right? There's, there's, there is a four here and a seven there, right? And you, you multiply, uh, and then you get 20 nodes. Um, this is an unweighted, undirected graph. It just so happens to be the case. Uh, therefore, if I use the symbol A, G, A sub, the name of the graph, right? G47, I guess I'm using this uh, heavy notation right now for a second. It's binary, right? Because it's an unweighted graph. It's also uh, symmetric because this graph is undirected. So the edges here, they have no direction. So uh, in other words, if I have uh, A, I, now, let me make it smaller, one second. If I have uh, A12 is positive, well, then A12 is equal to A21. All right, fine. So I would like to look at this uh, graph and ask you to estimate 
rho of a. Let's just, just, just call it this graph G and let's call A the adjacency matrix. I, as I'm doing this example, maybe I can drop the subscript. How do you estimate rho of A? In one second, just by looking at it. Oh, it's the number 17. Hmm? Something like that. Now, of course, it's not the number 17, but you can guess it. You can, you can, you can kind of guess it. And so um, you can guess some, some things about it. Here's one of the, and we will do it based on a few on a few simple concepts. One concept is that if I draw a circle around any node, so if I look at all the edges that leave a node, if the node is in the in the interior of the grid, the degree is four. If it's on the boundary, but not a corner, the degree is three. And if it's on a corner, the degree is two. This is enough information to estimate the spectral radius of A. Hmm? And so this is my, uh, my um, motivating uh, uh, pitch to you as to why you should read this material. It's kind of fun. You, you get to make these kind of statements. Similarly, you can make a statement about, about rho of, of another graph, like this one, where every node has degree D equal to three. So it's a regular graph um, in, in the sense that it's a... Uh... All right. So um, I will go about this step by step, and I'll, I'll share with you essentially the method of proof. So, but I'm, rather than the method, of, I'm just going to show you this this various bounding and monotonicity properties, which are fun to know. They're, they're, and they could come in handy at some point in time. So here's here's um, um, so let, let's remember one thing. So a row stochastic matrix has this property. Hmm? So A is non-negative, and A is non-negative, and it has it has an eigenvector one n, which is positive, right? What one n? Oh, pardon me. One n is positive, and and also the eigenvalue one is positive. Okay. I would like to, and, and by the way, we've seen that if if those are the properties, then the spectral radius of A is equal to one. So, so, so in other words, if I were to um, uh, draw the spectrum of A, so which is to say, put yourself in the complex plane and uh, draw uh, the location of all of the eigenvalues of A. Uh, this is not even center, so I can center it. There it is. And then um, we know, what, what do we know? We know that an eigenvalue is identically equal to one. Right for a row stochastic matrix, perfect, and all the others under some conditions, all the others are inside. Now the question is: suppose that you you, you don't know this fact for sure. Maybe you have a weaker a weaker property of a. Can you say something about where rho is? And so a weaker property is is this property. This is the property. Well, actually, a weaker property is this property. Suppose you know, what do you know? You know A is non-negative, so that's easy to check. And you know there is a vector, uh, instead of vector 1n, I'm going to allow an arbitrary vector x. And the vector is non-negative, but not necessarily uh, um, different from zero, different from zero, but it could have some entries equal to zero. So let me, let me, let me clarify my notation. So if I write x greater than or equal to zero, um, well, actually zero could be a scalar. So I write X belongs to Rn greater or equal to zero. Now it's a vector, each of whose entry is greater than or equal to zero. But then I don't want zero, you know, if, because otherwise A zero is clearly zero. Maybe the vector zero N, if I write the vector zero N like that, then it's pretty obvious that A zero N is equal to zero N. That gives me absolutely no information about A because any matrix A satisfies that property, right? Let me fix my matrix A here that, uh, that I have written badly. Okay, so I, if, if, if you think about this property here, if you use a vector zero, that is absolutely uninformative. But if I find a, non a vector different from zero, non-negative, and I have this inequality, the inequality is that, there exists a positive number, strictly positive number, R1, such that R1x is a lower bound entry-wise on Ax. Hmm? So notice that that equation looks a little bit like this one, meaning this is an equation, right? An equality, that's an inequality entry-wise 
Okay, now what do we know? Then the result, the, the, the proof is that the outcome is that R1 is a lower bound on the spectral radius. So if you, if by means of Hooker crooks, I give you an example and you can find a lower bound on a vector X such that AX is lower bounded by something positive with some positive entries, uh, uh, then you have a lower bound on row. Similarly, entirely analogously, if you can find an upper bound on A, but now I need one more property. I need X to be strictly positive, okay? This, this would not work without an assumption. Then this leads to an, a, a nice upper bound on row. Hmm? So I have obtained lower bounds on row R1 and upper bounds on row R2. Lower bounds and upper bounds. So, under some here, I have given to you sufficient conditions, not necessary, sufficient conditions such that R1 is less than or equal than rho of A, less than or equal than R2. So, this is starting to put the spectral radius in some ranges. Remember, the task that we will have is estimate the spectral radius of the adjacency matrix of that graph or of other. Cartesian graphs, right? Okay, so we're moving in that direction. Now, suppose that I want to get strong inequality, strict inequality. So I want to actually, can I give you some sufficient conditions such that R1 is strictly less than rho, which is strictly less than R2. I, I'd like to understand that case. Hmm? I'd like to understand that case. So, uh, of course, a couple of things need to happen. Otherwise, this task doesn't even make sense. Of course, I need to consider R1 strictly less than R2. Otherwise, I have a contradiction. And now, this statement three that I'm about to present, I need, I need more properties. I need, I need quite a bit. I need to assume that A is irreducible. OK, so now you have a non-negative irreducible matrix. I need the same two bounds that I had in one and two, which is R1x is a lower bound on AX and R2X is an upper bound. And then I also need, this is very reasonable. I also need to assume really that R1X and R2X are not equal to AX because if they are equal to AX, then there is no hope I can get this property here that I have emphasized. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that essentially really the key assumption is that under the same two upper and lower bounds as in one, two, if the matrix A is irreducible, then I obtain that the bounds are strict. Hmm? The bounds are strict. Perfect. So this is the first. So this is a kind of monotonicity slash bounding property. It tells you that, hey, if you have a matrix A and you multiply by something vector X and you know that you can either lower bound it or upper bound it, this is giving you some corresponding upper or lower bound on low, or maybe strict in some cases. All right, first, this is the first lemma of this section. And the proof is fun. The proof uses, uh, the proof uses two things. Number one, it uses the convergence uh, 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 theorem. So we know that um, um, certain, we, we know the convergence theorem, that if, the, if rho is greater than one, then things go to infinity, or if rho is less than one, then certain limits are equal to zero. The, the rest of the proof is based upon Peron Frobenius. The Peron Frobenius theorem for non negative matrices and the Peron Frobenius theorem for irreducible matrices, which is, which is here because A is irreducible. Okay. Now, um, here's another monotonicity property of my, of my matrices. And this is a crowded slide, but forgive me, I'm only going to, I'm only going to talk about the lemma. We're not going to talk about the proof, of course. And so essentially, here's another different monotonicity property. It goes like this. Suppose that you have two non-negative matrices and one is greater than or equal to the other entry-wise. If A prime is greater than or equal than A entry-wise, then rho has the same property. So rho is monotonic in the entries of A. If you have a matrix A and you add just a little bit of mass to one of the entries. Remember, A is non-negative. So you can think of the entries as if they were like amounts, you know, a, a positive amount of something. So if you add a little weight anywhere, the spectral radius cannot decrease 
maybe it remains constant or it increases, it increases. I mean, for example, it doesn't need to always increase. For example, suppose I give you a matrix, suppose I give you a diagonal matrix, 0 0.5 and one. Now, if I add some weight to 0 0.5 and I go to 0 0.6 and one, the spectral radius continues to remain equal to one. So this is the row of the, Row of this matrix is equal to one. Row of that matrix is still equal to one. So you don't gain by adding weight, by increasing the wrong entries. However, however, there's a second statement here. Suppose that I have, again, I have two matrices. One is, by the way, I had a greater than or equal to. Suppose you for sure add some mass. So A prime is strictly, at least in one entry is strictly greater than A. So you're, you're at, so the two matrices are bound by the relationship A is less than or equal than A prime and uh, A is different from A prime. So at least one entry has grown. So now, if it were to be true that the matrix A prime is irreducible, the larger of the two, not the smaller, the larger of the two is irreducible, then the bound is strict. Huh? Then the bound is strict. So you have a strict inequality there. Huh? So this is, this is wonderful. This is telling you for irreducible matrices, the spectral radius is a strictly monotone function. So if you strictly add even epsilon mass anywhere, then strictly increasing is the radius. By the way, this means that if you come back to my example here, suppose that, suppose that now I make, I add epsilon weight here and there. If I add epsilon in both locations, then this new matrix is irreducible. Uh, and now this is greater than one. I hope my example makes sense to you. The old spectral radius was equal to one. If I add um, if I add weights in um, uh, so adding weights doesn't necessarily mean you add the weight to entries that are positive. You can add weights also to entries that are zero. So that means you're even adding an edge whether you add an edge with some positive weight where there was no edge, or you increase the weight of an edge. Both cases are captured in this lemma by the simple property that, that uh, listed here, that A is less than or equal than A prime, and they're distinct. Okay, this is the end of my two monotonicity properties. Now, now I'm ready to look at the examples that I am interested in, and they're very nice. So, the first thing is, if you use the first lemma, the first lemma was that, oh, if you can find an X such that R1X is less than or equal than rho, pardon, is less than or equal than AX, which is less than or equal than R2X, then, um, then uh, this implies under mild assumption uh, that uh, R1 is less than or equal than rho of A, which is less than or equal than R2. This is the first lemma. And now we're gonna use as X, set X equal to one N. Just use one N. One N satisfies the assumptions of that lemma. It's actually positive instead of non-negative. So now um, what happens is that if you do A one N, this is a vector with all of the, with uh, this is a vector, right? Clearly that vector is upper and lower bounded by the vector of ones multiplied by the, sm the smallest of the entries of A1n or the largest of the entries of A1n. Why do I say that? Well, you have a vector, it has some entries, some entries are large, some entries are small, take the largest of them all and construct a vector that has every entry equal to the largest or construct a vector that has every entry equal to the smallest. Clearly, those are upper and lower bounds on A1n. But then by the first of the lemmas that I have shown to you, you obtain this simple result. So in other words, the spectral radius is upper and lower bounded. Well, let's say lower and upper bounded by the smallest 
or the largest of the rho sums of A. And by the way, from a graph theoretic point of view, this is the minimum of D out with respect to the node I less than equal than rho of A less than equal than the maximum with respect to I of D out of I. Hmm? Does that make sense? Because we said that the rho sum of the matrix is giving you the out degrees. And so this property is telling you, hey, if you are studying a graph, the smallest out degree is a lower bound and the largest out degree is an upper bound. Now we're able to come to these two examples here that I have here, one and two. So suppose that we have the complete bipartite graph K33. What is the minimum and the large? Well, first of all, here, this is D out, but these graphs that I have in pictures are undirected. So there is no D out, D in, it's just a degree. So this graph has degree three. Because it's a regular graph, D equal to three for all nodes, which what, what I mean to say is, is equal to DI for all I, this implies, hey, these inequalities are gonna become strict. Rho of A is equal to three, done. Why three? Well, because that's the degree of every node. So the spectral radius of the matrix is just three. So if you want a row stochastic matrix, you need to take the adjacency matrix of this graph and divide it by three. One third of the adjacency of K33, K33 is row stochastic. That's it. Now, instead for this graph here on the right, this graph here on the right, what do we know? Now we know that there are some nodes for which di is three, two, and four. So now we know two less than equal than rho of a, less than equal than four. So this is fine. I get my four that I wanted. I have a regular graph. I know I have a regular grid, not a regular graph. It's not a regular graph because some nodes have degree two, three, or four. But I am unhappy. I'm unhappy because I would like a smaller lower bound. I want a tighter lower bound. Can I make it tighter? Hmm? Remember, I want to find, I want to set myself in the situation for the uh, uh, grid graph where the um, minimum of the out degree is strictly less than the maximum of the out degree. So the graph is not regular because regular graphs are very particular. We want to look at more general cases. It turns out that I have an if and only if condition for you for when the spectral radius is strictly less than the maximum out degree. And this condition will be satisfied in the example of the, of the Cartesian graph. So here it will be, we, I am telling you that this condition will easily prove that rho will be strictly less than four. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm making the upper bound a little bit uh, uh, tighter, right? It's, well, it's a strict, it's a, it's a strict inequality. And what is the condition? The condition is a connectivity condition. It has to do with the, with the, with the powers of the graph, the powers of the matrix. It goes like this, and I'm already writing it for you in the, in the interpretation of graphs. And the condition goes like this. The condition is that um, pick any node who's, I know this is hard to see, but this is just the out degree. Uh, and I'll let you check that at home. This is just the out of node I. The out degree is maximum. Pick any node with maximum out degree. There exists a directed walk on the graph from each one of those nodes with maximum out degree to a node J with out degree strictly less than the maximum. This is easy to check. For any node with maximum out degree, there exists a path to a node. Actually, I don't even need to go there. I can just go to the boundary. There exists a path to the boundary of the Cartesian graph. Once you have reached the boundary of the Cartesian graph, the out degree is less than the maximum number, which was four. Therefore, the condition A here is satisfied. Perfect. For example, why do I say that? Why do I say, so this is a graph, as a graph, this is connected. There exists paths from every node to every other node. Therefore, the second condition, hey, this is always gonna be satisfied. All right, perfect. So for connected graphs, 
uh, if you have a if you have a gap between minimum and maximum out degree of the nodes, then immediately you know that the bounds that, that these bounds are are strict. Perfect. There is one special case which will come in handy in the next chapter for the purpose of completing certain proofs. So let me just quickly do this case, and that's the last. Uh, I'm going to skip proofs. This is the last uh, um, uh, comment that I will make. We will encounter in our travels, uh, we will encounter matrices that are said to be rho substochastic, which is to say matrices that have two properties. The first one is the natural one. Hey, I'm, I'm saying rho stochastic when, I'm saying rho stochastic when each row sum is equal to one. So rho substochastic is when the sums are less than equal than one less than equal than one. On the other hand, I also want to make 100% sure that at least one of the row sums is strictly less than one. So when I say row substochastic, I really mean to say at least one row sums to less than one. I, I want to exclude row stochastic matrices. Otherwise, the theorems are harder to, to state. It's just a convention. So here I'm saying there exists an, oops, there exists an I such that uh, by the way, let me just also clarify. So why do I write, why do I write E I transpose A one N? What is this? Well, E I is the vector that has, so E, e I is the vector that has all zeros everywhere, except at the entry, oops, sorry except zero, 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 except at the entry number i, where there is a one. Hmm? So this is the standard element of the canonical basis of vector in Rn. And then a1n is the vector which has d out one all the way to d out n, all of the out degrees of all of the nodes. So then clearly when you multiply these two vectors together, by the dot product or transpose, you, you get just d out i. All right, fine. Okay, so this is just to set the record straight and say we're going to be especially interested in graphs which are not regular, uh, direct graphs which are not regular because some nodes have out degree equal to one, other nodes have out degree less than one. Mm -hmm. Now remember that we are interested in what well, we just said that if the if the matrix is uh, if a is rho stochastic then rho of a is identically equal to one now it makes an enormity of sense to ask yourself the question suppose i have a matrix which is rho substochastic is it true that if you if you take one row you subtract a little bit of mass somewhere in that row from some entries where there is mass you subtract a little bit so then now that row sum is going to be less than one is it true when is it true that this implies that row of a is less than one when do i drop because i already know because of the monotonicity lemma that i showed you earlier that that necessarily for sure row of a is less than equal than one you subtract mass we said the spectral radius is a monotonic function of the entries of A, it cannot increase. So it, it either remains constant or it decreases. But I am very interested in understanding the case where it actually decreases. How do I understand that? Okay, so here's what the lemma tells you. The lemma tells you that, hey, um, A is convergent, which means, uh, because this is the beauty of, of rho stochastic, when a rho of A is less than one, this is the definition that A is convergent, right? And this will mean that xk plus one equal to a xk has the feature that xk goes to zero, right? A to the k goes to zero. So my matrix, my rho stochastic, my, my rho sub stochastic matrix is convergent if and only if the graph contains directed walks from each node without degree one to each node without degree less than one. This is the same property as before hmm, in the previous theorem. So this is a corollary. So long as from every node with degree one, you can find a directed path to go 
that goes to a node with degree less than one, then you're fine. Then, then you know for sure the spectral radius is strictly shrunk. And of course, simpler than saying condition one is to give a sufficient condition. Um, and the condition is that if the matrix is uh, irreducible, then for sure it becomes convert. It is convergent because if it's irreducible, you can find paths from every node to every other node. Certainly, you can find paths from nodes of degree one to nodes with degree uh, less than one. Okay, uh, I leave it to you to um, uh, to look at the proofs. They're kind of fun. Look at the historical nodes, and um, in conclusion. Uh, what we've seen, as stated, is um, this idea that non-negative matrices and weighted digraphs are deeply interconnected. We've seen that there is a silly fundamental lemma that, that tells you powers are the same as directed walks. And uh, it's, this, uh, it's, this, uh, it's this relationship here that you see, right, if and only if. Uh, and we've seen the consequences of it uh, in terms of uh, being able now to characterize irreducible, primitive, and, and, and even just column being, becoming positive in terms of connectivity properties of digraphs, strong connectivity, a periodicity, uh, as well as the existence of a global reachable node, respectively. And then finally, we've seen, uh, we've seen some fun little properties of monotonicity of the spectral radius and how that, that depends upon the entries of the matrix. But then again, even there, notions of irreducibility and existence of directed walks was, were playing a role in ensuring that the inequalities were strict. With this, I would like to thank you all for uh, having watched this video and I'll see you soon enough uh, for chapter five. Bye-bye.